Hello everyone, welcome back to Deciphering Phyrexian. Uh, in this episode, I have several things for you. For one, I think I discovered something important about how Phyrexian verbs work. I think I've also found evidence for a locative or maybe an accusative marker or of some kind. Uh, also, maybe we have a, a negative marker. And finally, I'm going to be answering to some comments from the previous videos. Anyway, uh, in this video, we're going to be looking at Vorinclex, Monstrous Rider. This is actually the newest example of Phyrexian we have. Uh, this is uh, the card in Phyrexian, and here we have the translation in English. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to read the, the, the English version so that we know what the Phyrexian text is supposed to say, and then we are going to analyze the Phyrexian text and see what we can learn. Uh, anyway, so this is Vorinclex, Monstrous Rider. It is a legendary creature. It is a Phyrexian Praetor. Praetor? Okay, I'm not sure how to pronounce this word. Uh, it has Trample and Haste. Oh, by the way, if you don't play Magic the Gathering and you are here only for the linguistics, uh, just wait a minute. We are going to get to that in a, in a moment. Uh, anyway, so if you would put one or more counters on a permanent or player, put twice that many of each of those kinds of counters on a permanent or player instead. So that's interesting because here we have one sen sentence. In fact, well, in the, in the two cards we have two sentences. So that's interesting. And the, and, and the second sentence is, if an, if an opponent would put one or more counters on a permanent or player, they put half that many of each of those kinds of counters on that permanent or player instead, round that down. So the interesting part is, uh, is that, as you can see, these two sentences repeat many words, but there are some key differences. For example, here it is saying, if you would put, and here it's saying, if an opponent would put, and double and half. So the fact that these texts are so similar, and yet that they have those key differences, can be very useful when we are trying to translate things. Because remember that all of this is done just by comparisons. Oh, and by the way, uh, we are not going to be looking exactly at the card here. Uh, what I did is to transcribe the text myself. And I did that for two reasons. One, it is very useful when you are trying to decipher a language to write it yourself. Because, I don't know, there's something that happens when you start writing a language, even if you don't exactly know what it means, that it starts, I don't know, getting into your brain. It's different to see a sequence of symbols and, and say, oh, I think I've read that before to say, oh, I think I have written that before. I, I don't know, it, it hits different. And the second reason it's, is this. Look at this. Look at these diacritics. Can you honestly tell me what those diacritics are supposed to be? For example, look at this diacritic here. Is that supposed to be something like this? Or something like this? We have also seen diacritics like this before. Or, or what about this one? Is that the thing that goes like this? Or maybe it's like this? I don't know. And it happens all the time and it happens across all the damn cards. I see just so many diacritics and I know, I'm not sure what they are. It doesn't matter how much you zoom in and this is the highest resolution I could find. I'm just not sure what these diacritics are. And so for that reason, I decided to write it myself with my best guess as to what those diacritics are supposed to be. And if there are some inconsistencies or some mistakes, well, in, in the diacritics, well, that's the reason. But at least the, the, the consonants themselves, the, the main part of the consonant is quite clear. And honestly, that's all we know. So let's start with the name. So we know that this is supposed to say Vorinclex, Monstrous Rider. Okay, so for starters, uh, this is the name for Vorinclex. And there's a space between Vorinclex and Monstrous Rider. And we also see that, remember that in Phyrexian, the, these, they don't tend to write spaces, except when they do. But most of the time, they separate words with this symbol. And we don't see it here with Monstrous Rider. So that means that it is a single word, which makes sense. Because remember, we've learned from uh, other examples that Phyrexian seems to have uh, a little bit of agglutination, like in German. And so apparently Monstrous Rider is a single word. And then we have this symbol here, this dumb symbol. What does it mean? <laughs> what is it doing? Actually, some people in the comments had some very good ideas about what it could be, but <laughs> none of us are sure. And maybe, maybe it is separating monstrous from rider. Maybe this is monstrous, maybe this is rider. 
who knows? We just have to keep moving on because there's a lot of things to go through. Uh, this is the creature type. And we know that this is a legendary creature. And in fact, uh, we know because we have seen examples of the word creature before that this is the root for creature, which means that this must be the root for legendary. And then we have Phyrexian Praetor. And check this out. Here we have the uh, space marker. The, so this means that these are two separate words. And we recognize this as Phyrexia, except there's one key difference. All the other times we have seen Phyrexia, like, yeah, it has this symbol for the F. Uh, let me write the whole thing. When we have seen the name of Phyrexia, we have seen this symbol, which is pretty much the same that we see here, except for this last symbol that doesn't appear here. Which is interesting because, well, here, Phyrexian is an adjective, it's not a noun. So the lack of this last uh, consonant perhaps is telling us something about how adjectives and nouns work in Phyrexian. But we'll have to, we'll have to look at more examples to be sure of that. And yeah, probably this means Praetor or Praetor or however that word is pronounced. This is one of our major breakthroughs in this video. Uh, here we have two words, trample and haste. And the first thing is to notice that both of them start with the same three symbols, okay? And this is not something uh, I noticed myself. This, the credit for this actually goes, uh, let me show you his Reddit post, uh, to Citrix Inferno, or Citrus Inferno. He did some work on translating the Boring Clicks card. And he noticed that these three symbols repeat on many static abilities of cards, like Vigilance, Indestructible, or some other. And so he thinks that maybe this means something like always. And okay, I agree that this is related somehow to static abilities. I'm just not sure that it means always. Per perhaps it does. I'm just, I, I would need more data points to be sure of that. And I think we just don't have them. Uh, but anyway, so apparently this means, well, given that this is trampled, so maybe this goes something like go over or pierce or penetrate or something like that. I'm not sure. Uh, but then the, the, main, the more important thing is what happens with the word for haste. Because check this out. Remember that we had in the word for, in the, in the example of Jagmoth's Testament, it was talking about cards going into exile, if it's put into exile or if it, if it is put into your graveyard. And so we look for that, those examples and we concluded that this was the verb for put. Now we have reason to believe that was wrong. Uh, and, and remember that we thought that this was put and we saw this difference in the vowels and we, we thought that maybe this was some kind of, maybe the mood, like because one is, if that happens, then this happens. But anyway, so look at the end of the word haste. And actually it is here. I just transcribe it here so that we can look at it easier. It is exactly the same symbols as we saw in the word for put uh, in Jack Mott's Testament. But it doesn't make much sense for haste to be talking about putting something, right? So maybe it actually means like to go. Like if it, and we could better translate the word for Jack for the, the words from Jack Mott's Testament as if this card goes into exile or if it goes to your graveyard or something like that. So that's likely, but the main difference is why the, the vowel here, like what's going on? Because in the other examples we saw the, of that word, it have a vowel here and here it doesn't, but here it is in a verb. And that's the thing that that's the breakthrough here in haste. It is an adjective. It is telling us about a property of something. It is not it is not a verb. It is not saying that Boring Clex is doing something or that the player or that the opponent, no. And since this is not a verb, it doesn't have this vowel because maybe this vowel is a conjugation. And okay, maybe if you only speak English, this might sound very weird to you, but check this out. For example, in Spanish, I can say, this is the, the verb poder. Uh, it means to can, to be able. And if I just say poder, it just means nothing is happening. I'm just talking about the action of to be able in the abstract. But if I say puedo, now it means I, I'm saying 
I can, I am able to do something. And by just changing these few things in this world, I, I just change this vowel and I change the ending of the word. I'm telling you who is doing the action and when I am doing it. I am able right now. And so maybe in Phyrexian, something similar is happening. By changing the vowel or adding it in the first place, you are changing something from an abstract, like go, to go in the abstract, to go in, in a particular sense. Like if it goes, well, then, then it goes somewhere else. And then uh, uh, Citrix, uh, Citrus Inferno also thinks that this might be then fast so that the whole thing would be always go fast. But I like better the idea that maybe this means hurry. Like always goes in a, in a hurry or something like that. Uh, but anyway, but despite what, what these words could mean, I find this uh, breakthrough about the vowels a lot more important because we know from, from the beginning we have known that Phyrexian doesn't write all the vowels. And maybe now we know why. Maybe Phyrexian doesn't need to write the vowels because the words follow some uh, predictable patterns with the vowels. And so if they are not there, you can use that predictable pattern to know what they should be. And then when they change, well, they change to specify some, to give some specific information. And that's why they need to write them in some situations, but they don't write to need them. Don't, they don't need to write them all the time. Okay, so this seems very important. This seems like a very important breakthrough and we are still not done. There's a, a little bit more important things to go through. Here is the part where it talks about if you would put counters on a player. And for that, I should tell you that the community has long noticed that pretty much all sentences in Phyrexian start with a sequence of two symbols. Not always the same two symbols, but for example, uh, ma many sentences start with this sequence and turns out that all of those sentences are translated to present tense in, in English. So the community seems to think that these are tense markers and that seems like very reasonable to me. I'm, I'm, so far, this is what I believe, uh, that these are tense markers and they are always made of two symbols and then they have this uh, space marker. So these two symbols here seem to me like a tense marker, a tense marker that makes some kind of conditional tense but then we don't have this space marker and then we have this. And I think that maybe this is some kind of auxiliary verb, like a would or maybe a when, because many languages, instead of using if, they use uh, variations of the word when. So yeah, maybe. But what, what is more important is what's going on here. This is supposed to be the word for player, but it looks very similar to the word from opponent that we find in LH Norn. In fact, look, these two symbols are the same, uh, and these two symbols are the same, the same. Here we have these repeated vowels here, but that makes sense because we know this is a plural, and we know this is a singular, it's talking about a single player, and then they are the same, and then the same, and, and then, no, actually, that those two are not the same. The main difference seems to be between this thing here and this thing here. And so I think that this is another example of non-concatenative morphology. I think that after this circle symbol, the, the words in Phyrexian, well, at least these words have a slot to put other things inside. So for example, if we put this symbol inside this root word, it means that it is maybe the opposite. And so you change player to the opposite of the player. So that's the opponent. And then maybe what's going on here is that you are putting the word for player and you are inserting these symbols here. Uh, and what I think they mean is that perhaps they are uh, maybe a kind of like a locative marker that is saying that the player is a place where you are going to put the counters uh, that, that the card is talking about. So maybe this could be something like on or at or in. And in fact, uh, there is a, another example, we are gonna get to that, uh, is in fact the next one, if I remember correctly, that gives a lot of evidence to this thing here uh, being a sort of locative marker. And just remember that I don't think that the circle is part of that because th the fact that it appears in different contexts, this circle, makes me think that it's just 
that's just how the world starts. And this is just non-concatenative morphology, that you are changing the inside of the world. And yeah, because we have seen Phyrexian do that already in other examples. So why not here? Although, I don't know, maybe it is a coincidence and the negation marker and the locative marker both start with this circle symbol and then they are different. And so this would be, you are concatenating something at the beginning of the world instead of changing something inside. So that, l let me uh, tell you what I mean. So my, I think that if I were to write the word for player without anything modifying it, it would be something maybe like this, okay? I think this is the word for player. And then by adding things in between the circle and the second symbol here, you can change it to opponent or on the player, or you can change the meaning of this noun. But maybe the word for player is just like, without uh, adding anything, is just this. If, this. if the first example is true, then this would be an example of non-concatenative morphology uh, because you are changing the, the inside of the word. And if the root word for player is this one, then you are just concatenating something at the beginning and it would be, well, concatenative morphology. But we don't know yet, but we can be pretty sure that this is a, a sort of locative marker because of the next example. Here we say, it is saying that on, if you would put counters on a permanent or something, and what do we see? The same sequence of symbols that we saw from on a player. This seems, I, I don't know, I don't, it, it could be a coincidence, but I don't think it is. And I think that maybe um, this whole thing here is uh, kind of like the word for permanent or something. But actually, let me make that one that a little bit clearer because in the word for boring clicks, like there is this sequence of symbols that repeats in, you know, we find it twice in the card. And I'm not sure if this is supposed to be just two times this letter that we have seen before because the line seems to interrupt, it seems to vanish between these two symbols and they seem to curve inside and then the line continues. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Uh, also, we have seen, for example, in the card for Elishnorn that sometimes the line interrupts, like when it says about uh, your creatures getting plus two, plus two, the line interrupts and then continues. So, so I don't know, <laughs> that, that quite simple. I don't know if this is just a, a style or if this means something. So it's just a symbol that is driving me crazy. But then we have the word for or, and we have, there are other examples for or. And, and just, can I just get your, your appreciation for how perfect this circle I made was? It is nearly a perfect circle and I just did it like freehand. It is so beautiful. Anyway, there it is. And then we have the word for counters. And check that out. It has the double uh, vowel in the middle, exactly as we would expect for a, for a word that is translated as a plural. So at this point, I'm pretty much confident, like there's no doubt in my mind that this is how Phyrexian marks plurals. And then we get again the word for put, the word that really is for put and not apparently to go as we thought. And just I just want you to keep in mind that the vowel that we are looking in this verb here, and I'm gonna write it here so that you remember, this is the vowel that we are looking in the word put in the first sentence. And that's gonna be important later. Please remember that. And then we have uh, this other example, this other part of text. And this is uh, instead. We also see it in Jack Mott's Testament uh, uh, as being instead. And then we have this thing here, Again, maybe an auxiliary verb, something like that. We had not seen the, the other times we saw the word instead, it was followed by, by this symbol. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. Uh, this apparently has to be the word for double. Not much to say here, just apparently how you say double in Ferexian. Or maybe there's something that there to, to, to know and I, I'm just not seeing it, who knows. And then put again, and, and again, look at the vowel they are using. Uh, but let's move on to the next example because this is the beginning of the second sentence when it is talking about the opponent 
and it's very interesting that we see that thing that I think is a tense marker, and then this thing that I think is an auxiliary verb. This thing that I think, thing that I think, thing, thing that I think. Anyway, and then we have opponent, and it's very interesting that this is the first time that we see the word opponent in singular, as opposed to when we saw it in a LH norm as a plural, but otherwise it's exactly as we would expect. And then we see on a player, uh, again, as we saw it before, uh, with this thing here that I think is a, a locative marker. And then pretty much is just, remember that the text for, for uh, boring clicks is very repetitive. So is, we are just seeing a lot of repetition. And then we see on a permanent, also this thing that I think is a locative marker, these symbols here that drive me crazy. Like, seriously, this symbol here <laughs> and this line here, they drive me crazy. And then we have uh, the or, and then uh, a word, uh, uh, a space marker, and then counters in plural, as we would expect them to be. So, so far, so good. And um, here it gets really interesting because here, okay, <laughs> a lot of, there's a lot of things going on here. First of all, I think this is a tense, a tense marker, but again, it's weird that it's not followed by this symbol uh, as, as it is in other examples. Uh, I'm gonna make a video just uh, about tense markers uh, in the future, but for now, just trust me that most of the time they are always, that you know, pretty much all other examples they are followed by this symbol, but anyway. And then we find the word for put that we have seen several times in this card, but notice the difference. 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 Oh! The vowels are different and they are not just different. When it was talking about you, about the player, this is the vowel they used and they used it every time. And when they talk about the opponent, this is the vowels they used and they use it every time. Do you know what that means? That means that this vowel is encoding the subject of the action. Phyrexian verbs encode who is doing the action. And, okay, we suspected that already, but this seems like a, all the confirmation in the world. And, and it is very consistent. We are gonna see the verb uh, to put again, uh, and talking about the opponent, and whenever it talks about the opponent, it uses this vowel. And whenever it talks about you, it uses this vowel. And that's amazing because this is a, this is a, a breakthrough, and then we have of course the word uh, instead that we had seen from Jack Mott's testament, and then something else. Uh, I'm gonna analyze all these auxiliaries in their own video at some point, or or whatever they are. I'm gonna analyze them uh, at some other point, but then we get uh, this is okay. Let me see where the word for double starts. Check, let me check my notes. Um, okay, so here is where the word, we have already seen the word double before, and it was like this. So this has to be negating uh, the, the double, like the opposite of double is half, I suppose. And check that out. This symbol is the same symbol that was in the word opponent where we thought that we were seeing like the, that negation marker, right? This symbol is what we speculated was negating the word for player back in the word for opponent. And we see it again here, uh, negating the word double. Of course, we see it along with a bunch of other symbols. So I'm not entirely sure what's going on here, but yeah, maybe, maybe it is negating something or maybe this is just another word entirely uh, and that just happens to have the same symbol. We are not sure at this point, but it's just something interesting to notice. And then finally, he have the, uh, the word for put and what's the vowel? Exactly. So yeah, it seems that Phyrexian verbs encode, uh, they are conjugated for who is doing the action but may not necessarily for when is the action happening, because that is marked with the tense markers at the beginning of the verb. And it seems that there are also uh, like a locative marker or something like that. And there seems to be also some kind of uh, negations markers like, 
We are getting uh, closer to understanding how the grammar of Phyrexian works, and there seems to be that, uh, that there's a lot of non-concatenative morphology going on. And now, let's respond to some of the comments. Uh, first off, many people have very good ideas about what this horizontal line could be. Um, maybe it's like a space, like me, Rodin, or Jack Moth. Uh, also, uh, there, uh, they, it could be representing gemination. That, that's also a, a very good idea. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, and yeah, maybe it's a semi-featural alpha syllabary. That, that seems like a very good idea. Uh, but if it's featural, it's not entirely featural. Like, it has some featural things, but they are obscured by irregularities of other things, much like a natural language would do it. Um, so yeah, this is just uh, things to, to keep in mind. I mean, at this point, we cannot say one way uh, or another. Uh, here, Paul Gibby explains something much better th than I could. Uh, this is what I wanted to say. Like, we find in, in the word for other worlds, uh, worlds maybe is in plural, but the word other that is agglutinated to it is not. But it makes sense because their other isn't like a standalone word. Okay, look at me now. I'm not explaining it nearly as well as Paul Gibby did in, in, in his comment or her comment. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, a very good explanation. Uh, also, many people think that this uh, symbol that we see all the time uh, where a circle crossed by a line is the Phyrexian symbol because, sure, it appears in, in a lot of examples in magic as a f f Phyrexian symbol, Phyrexian mana. In fact, I think it appears in the card for Boring Clicks. Uh, let, me, let me see. Yeah, yeah, here you can see it. Uh, a circle and a line. Yeah, there, 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 you see, there you have it, the Phyrexian symbol. Now, is that... I, I agree, that's the Phyrexian symbol, but here's the thing. Oops. Here's the thing. When you, whenever you see a T written in the Latin alphabet, you don't immediately go, oh, that's a Christianity symbol. It's just a coincidence. So, yeah, maybe, maybe it could have some significance. And maybe whenever we see that, that's the symbol of Phyrexia. Um, or, or maybe it's just a coincidence. Maybe it's just that they have uh, this line going through their letters, and one of their letters is a circle. So, yeah. <laughs> just one of those other things that we don't know. And then here, Dorf Bebonia, uh, which I suppose is German, uh, is telling me that we were actually right and there was a, really a mistake in Jack Mott's testament, which is really vindicating, it's, it's really good to know. Uh, apparently that uh, tweet was taken down for some reason, uh, but you can still check it out in the web archive. And finally, uh, uh, there's also the possibility that maybe Phyrexians pronounce words slightly different from the way we do. So maybe they say Mirondin or something like that, and that would explain that uh, random sort of N sound in the middle. And that's a very good idea. I had not considered that. And finally, dog strokes tell me that maybe we shouldn't try to decipher the Phyrexian language. And you know, maybe we shouldn't. And But we are going to do that anyway. And that's it for today. Uh, I hope you enjoy that. I, I think I'm going to take a, bre uh, a break from doing videos about Phyrexian for a while to make videos about other stuff, but don't worry. I'm going to continue making videos about deciphering the Phyrexian language until either we can read every example of Phyrexian without ambiguity, knowing exactly what they mean, and we can write in Phyrexian, we can write novels, we can translate the Bible to Phyrexian. Either that or... Uh, Wizards of the Coast releases a book uh, called something like the entire, the complete Phyrexian grammar or something like that. And if they ever do that, I'm going to read the entire book on a live stream or something. Uh, but anyway, uh, thanks a lot for watching. Please leave your comments. I'm going to answer to the comments in, in the next video about deciphering Phyrexian. And yeah, thanks for watching.